strong enough? Okay. So we're going to continue on. We started, before the three weeks, we started Kavi Yashar. And we're doing the Kavi Yashar every week. The Kavi Yashar is a very deep book. And a lot of it is based on uh, Jewish perspective, like Musar, Hashkafan. But it's also very enrooted in Kabbalah. A lot of the ideas, a lot of the concepts here are very enrooted in Kabbalah. But it's more like surface level Kabbalah. It's not very deep. It's something that people can understand. So this week, this is what we left off. He's going to discuss how much we need to be careful from people that are fake. Not only should a person stay away from them, but a person should also be careful from them. That's going to be this week's topic. He says, Shlomo Melech says in Kohelet, Ati tzadik arben. Don't be too righteous. Don't be too big of a tzadik. You have to understand what Shlomo Melech meant. Obviously, it didn't mean that a person shouldn't be righteous. A person should be righteous. But Shlomo Melech, what he was saying there is, don't be exaggerative. Don't be exaggerative in being righteous. He brings over here, he says, And he brings the Gemara Sota that says, You have to be careful from people that look like they're Purushim. Purushim means like they look like they're very big tzaddikim. They pretend to be like they're very righteous. They're very good characters. They're able to pretend like as if they were... But what? He says it's all only a portrayal on the outside. They behave very righteous on the outside. But deep down inside, that's not where they are. They behave, they really are internally and who they are is really not righteous. But they behave on the outside as if they're very righteous because they want to be able to receive that attention or that uh, respect or whatever else it might be they want to receive through the outside. He says, sometimes you might somebody find somebody that looks like a very righteous person, it looks like a very big tzaddik, only to find out that who he really was internally was completely different than what we thought. Brings a story. He says there was a very wealthy person and he was a Tamil Chacham. And when he got older, he wanted to move to Eretz Israel. So when he was traveling to Eretz Israel, when he was getting close to Eretz Israel, he went to one of the cities over there where there was like an Arab city. And the whole city was full of soldiers and army people. And he got a little bit nervous because he had a lot of assets with him. When he was traveling to Eretz Israel, it wasn't like today. You could just go there, open up a bank account, wire everything and just go there. It doesn't work like that. You have to actually physically bring all your wealth with you. So he went over there and he went to a shul and he found this one guy. His name is Ravi Alexander. And this guy sitting there davening with his talit and his tefillin. And he's looking like he's righteous and he's pretending like he's a big tzaddik and he's davening and... So he looks at him and he thinks, wow, he's such a righteous person. So he comes to him and he says, look, I'm very concerned. I don't want to take all my assets with me to, to Eretz Israel. There is a lot going on on the streets over here. I'm scared to travel. There's a lot of army over here. Can, you, can I leave it here with you? Can I leave my box over here with my money here with you? And I'm going to go to Eretz Israel. I'm going to find a place to stay. I'm going to get myself a house. And then I'm going to come back and safely bring it over there. So I don't have to walk around. I have to travel with it. I told him, yeah, sure, no problem. He told him, I'll watch it for you, Bezrat Hashem, you know, all these holy righteous words, everything. So I told him, okay, he gave it to him. And when he went, this individual went, and he made himself a house in Eretz Hashem, he came back, he goes back to this guy, this guy sitting there reading Tehillim, reading Perik Shira, as if he's going to bring the Mashiach any moment. Right, Suddenly, this guy comes to him and it says, where is my treasure chest? Where is the, the money that I gave you to hold on to? He said, I don't know what you're talking about. Said, Just a few weeks ago, I left here. I was scared because there was army and people all over the place. I was concerned. I didn't want to take it with me. He's like, I asked you to watch it. You said you were going to watch it. He asked him where it is. He said, I have no idea what you're talking about. He said, you never left anything with me. I never saw you in my life. And he started to scream at him and he started to curse him to get out of there. And this guy is thinking to myself, Wait, what is he going to do? What is he going to do? How is he going to get it out of him? So what did he do? This guy went and he davened to Hashem. He said, Hashem, I can't blame this individual. I can only tell you, Hashem, that I relied on you. 
He said, when I looked at this guy, he looked like a tzaddik, he looked like a very righteous person. I didn't know he is the way he is. Right? What should I do now? And he was davening and he was crying to Hashem. That was all of his assets, that was all of his money that he was going to live off of when he went to Eretz Yisrael. Didn't have anything else. Suddenly somebody came to him and he started to tell him, Yo, I can help you. You know, I hear him. He, he heard him talking to Hashem. He said, I can help you. He didn't know that this person was Eliyahu Hanavi. He told him what? He said that this guy, go and give him simanim. Go and give him simanim and he's going to He's going to give it back to you. He said, what's the siman? He said, go to him and tell him that him and his wife, uh, on, Yom, uh, this, on Pesach, they ate chametz. And tell him also on Yom Kippur, he woke up in the morning before he went to shul and he ate something small. Tell the siman, right? You would never realize. And the outside, he wouldn't give off such an impression. So he went to this guy's house and he told his wife, he said, listen, your husband told me that I should come pick up my case with all my money that I left by him a few weeks ago. And he told me to give you signs that he sent me. And he told her, you did this, you ate chametz, you ate on Yom Kippur, right? And she said, okay. So she went and she gave it to him. And then afterwards, what happened? He was very happy. But this guy found out, right? What happened? He was very upset, the guy who tried to steal the money. But his point being is, is like sometimes you might look at people on the outside and get very impressed by who people are. But we don't realize the person who might look a certain way on the outside, that's not, not who he might be on the inside. That's what the Kavah Yashar is trying to tell you. Right? When people sometimes are a little bit too righteous or too over-exaggerated on the outside, you have to be a little bit concerned that it might be fake, something might not be real, something might be wrong. That's going to be, he's going to bring. And he says, what's one of the ways that you could tell that if a person is really righteous or not? He says, one of the biggest things my name you can tell if a person is righteous, if you have to see how he behaves with his money in life. Is he honest in business? Is he honest with people? Or is he tricky with money? Is he a crook? Is he go and uh, buy stuff in, in the store and buys, I don't know, goes to Costco, buys a whole bunch of furniture, uses it for the summertime, then returns it? Does he do these kind of funny things? Right? Or is he straight? Is he honest with his money? He says, you want to know if a person is righteous? You have to see how honest he is with his money. How straight he is in business. How honest he is with people. How trustworthy he is gives a very strong um, depression, uh, impression of who a person is deep down inside. He says over here, he He says, brings another story. He says, this one where a very wealthy person, right? He, he was getting very old and he had only had one kid. So he left over all of his wealth to this one kid. He left over all his wealth to this one kid and he told his son, he said, my son, I'm going to warn you. He's like, if you see people that are behaving too much, people that are too chasidu, too righteous, too much sadikim on the outside, they look like they're over, you know, like too much on the outside, like very strange already. It gets to a point where they're too strange. And he says, you have to be careful from those type of people. Right? People that are too much have to be careful from those type of people. The truth is, Chamim tell us, a person has to hide his righteousness. A person has to hide his greatness. Right? If a person is, uh, is, 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 uh, is this big, he should show like he's this big. Right? Unfortunately, it's the other way around. Right? Some people are this small, they want to show like they're this big. Right? So that's what he's trying to tell you, that you have to be very careful from people that look over-exaggerated uh, righteous. And he's going to bring you a story, and now to previous point as well. He brings a true story. Is there's this one older man, he was, had a lot of wealth, he was passing away, he had one son, and he gave him his money, he said, my son, you want to live a good life? Stay away from fake people, stay away from people that are uh, trying to impress other people, try to show somebody who they're really not on the outside. And this guy, his father passed away, he took his father's money, and now it came time for him to get married. He married a girl. This girl had no parents, her parents passed away. She was poor, but he liked her. She was very pretty and so on. She looked very righteous. She dressed very righteous. Right? She used to read to Elim, everything. The little girl looked like a very righteous girl, looked like a very good girl. So one day her husband comes and he tells her the true story. He comes and he tells her, let's go and travel around. Let's go travel around the country together. She says, no, I'm concerned. I'm scared. She says, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm very pretty. I don't want people to look at me. I don't want to make people sin. Right? If a girl, you know, she, she's modest, she's dressed modest. How could she make people sin? If a girl is just modest, she doesn't have to be so over-exaggerated. You can go outside. If a girl's provocative and she goes outside and people look at her, you're right, she's making a lot of avirot. Every person that looks at her makes another avirah. 
Why? Because looking is an Isidoraita. So anybody who she causes to look, it's her sin that she takes. You can make a hundred, two hundred sins a day. But this girl is just mad. He's going to look at her. He can't even see her. Right? But why? He's like, he got a little concerned. When she told him that, he remembered what his father said. When people are over-exaggeratively righteous on the outside, you have to be a little bit concerned who they are on the inside. So the husband said, okay. He went on his own. He says, a few months later, the husband made copies of all the keys in his house. He didn't tell his wife anything. And he gave his wife all the keys of the house. And he told her, I'm going to go on a business trip. I'll be back six, seven months. I'm going to go on a business trip. I have to go travel around the world after. She said, okay. He made her, she made him some food, so on and so forth. He went, like as if he traveled. He went outside of the city and then he came back like a week later. Right, and he got himself a hotel in the city. And in the middle of the night, he went to sneak into his house. And unfortunately, he was surprised to see that his wife is not alone at home. Right, and then when his wife saw that he came home, she started to tell the other guy, go kill him. She was embarrassed. This guy, Misken, right, he got scared. He ran out. He ran out of his own house and he went very far. It says that this individual... He found himself a bench. He was like so depressed. He found himself a bench somewhere and he started to sleep there. So that same night, that same is a true story. He said that same night, somebody stole money from the king. Somebody stole like something from the king's treasure house. And they were trying to find who it is. And they found this guy, Misken. This guy who just had this whole story with. They find him laying on the bench outside. Right? So they, probably, they thought that he was the thief that stole from the king. They told him, hello, you're the one who stole from the king? They started checking him, doing everything they couldn't. They found this guy. They said, you're the one who stole it. We find him outside somewhere. They probably thought he took it and he hid it. Right? And then afterwards, they were threatening him. They took him and they were bringing him to be hung. They were, th they were probably thinking that he was going to be so scared that he's going to give in. And when they were bringing him to be hung, the priest came along and the priest came to him and told him, listen, right? Now is your chance. Convert before you die. Right? He wants to convert him. Before he dies. And, the, that, and while they were walking, and the priest is convincing this Jewish guy to convert before they kill him, right? He says, when they were walking, there was like a garbage can over there. And the priest told the people that are walking, he said, don't walk this way. Walk around. Why? Because there are bugs on the floor. We're not allowed to step on bugs and kill them. They're eating, right? That's what the priest said. So this guy, again, he saw over-exaggerated righteousness, right? That's, the, that's what he's trying to point out over here. He saw that the priest was over-exaggerated in his righteousness. He was like, too much. You could already see that it was fake. It wasn't real. So who did he say? He's like, oh, I remember what his father said. This guy is also like this, this priest. He pretends like he's very righteous on the outside. Even a buck he doesn't want to step on. He already sees that he's a character. So he went and he told the, the, the king's people that are walking him. He said, you want to know the truth? He said, me and the priest were in on it together. We stole it together. Right? That's what he told them. Oh yeah, the people got very curious. They immediately sent the king's people to go check the priest's house. They went in the priest's house and what did they find? The stolen merchandise that was from the king's palace. From the priest, the priest himself sold it. <laughs> right? And they went immediately, they took the priest, they two-faced the king. This is the priest of the king. He two-faced the king and they killed him. And then they asked the guy, what do you and the priest have to do with each other? How did you come together to do this? Right? He said, I tell you the truth. He told him the whole entire story with his father, the well, the wife. And the king realized that this poor Jew didn't do anything. And unfortunately got stuck at the wrong time, at the wrong place. Right? And he let him go. Right? He let him go. So what he's trying to say over here, you see from here, that sometimes you could see somebody on the outside. Right? He talks like he's very righteous. He tries to he behaves like he's very righteous. But it doesn't necessarily tell you who the person is inside. You have to use a little bit more brains. You have to be able to tell who a person is internally. And when you see people that are over-exaggeratively righteous on the outside, he says you have to be a little bit concerned. He says sometimes if you see people, they're like, they're like, Akol Kol Yaakov. You know, Akol Kol Yaakov? They learn Torah, they daven, but what? When it comes to business, their hands are like Esav, right? When it comes to uh, anything to do with, you know, monetary for some reason over there they forget that Hashem exists so his point over here was is that you have to be careful for people that are over exaggeratively righteous on the outside and not only that you have to be one of the ways that you could tell who a person is righteous is you could see how he does in his business transactions
Right? Just because if a person is corrupt, if a person is crooked, you stay away from him completely. Don't think he's your friend because just like what he does to other people today, tomorrow he could do the same thing to you. People like this, they have friends today, they don't have friends tomorrow. They could do anything to anybody. And there he first says, these type of people, he says, stay away from. When you make friends, you like a righteous friend. How do you know if a person is really righteous? You see how a person is when his dealings. You see how a person is in his business. You see how honest a person is. When you see a person is righteous and honest when it comes to even financial dealings and how he deals with his money, then you know this person is righteous. Then you could stay close to this person. Now, I want to discuss halakha. This halakha is very applicable. It's going to start kicking in now. The halakhot of Kamech Yashan and Kamech Hadash. Right? Not everybody is aware of what Kamech Yashan and Kamech Hadash is. Right? A lot of people say, right, you have to keep Yashan, you have to keep Yashan. And a lot of people are asking, what is Yashan? What is Hadash? I remember one time somebody made bread and they're like, yeah, this is Yashan. We bought that company, Kamech. Right? They think the company Kamech is Yashan. They don't know what they think about Kemach. Is that one, one thing has nothing to do with the other. It's just a company of flour, right? People are not aware of what Yashan is. I remember I went into a place to eat in Flatbush. And then a good Ashgachan. And I see that the Mashgiach looks like a Yeshiva Bachar. Looks like a full Yeshiva Bachar. I asked him, is everything Yashan here? He tells me everything is Yashan. And then I asked, what about the meat? Where is it from? So on. Not that I'm concerned, but you have to know the standards. What your standards are, you have to see if it fits your standards. So I asked him. So yeah, this is Bet Yosef, that's that. And the owner comes out, he says, even the chicken is Bet Yosef, he tells me. I already understood, they don't know what they're talking about, right? But, uh, but okay, we ate whatever we ate over there. And then, interestingly enough, I see that same guy who was a mashgiach, and bring two points in one story. The same guy looked like the mashgiach, who's driving around a bicycle outside without a keeper. He looks like him. Makara, what can I just look like a Shiva Bakr the other day in the place? <laughs> right? And it's funny, when he told me, he himself asked me, what is Yashan? He says, yeah, everything is coming Yashan. He just knows to say it. Right? But he asked me at the end, what is Yashan? People don't know what Yashan is. They heard of such a concept. They think, what's the problem? It's just a piece of bread. It's just dough. It's just flour. It's just a cookie. It makes a difference. A Yashan, not Yashan. So, what Yashan is as follows. Any wheat, any wheat or five grains that were planted after Pesach, really it's even before Pesach, within three days, let's say, it's a three days, two weeks, it is three days. Any wheat or five grains that were planted from two days within Pesach and on, two days within Pesach and on, say I took wheat, it's two days before Pesach, I planted it. Now it's Sukkot time, right? This is when everything starts to grow. Now you want to harvest it. So all of that wheat that was planted from two days before Pesach and on, I came along now and I want to harvest it. All that wheat and all that flour and all that, everything that grows, all those five grains that grow during that time, that's all considered Chadash. What's Chadash? That's considered a new... Uh, new grains, right? New produce, new barley, new wheat, new spelt, new rye, new oats. It's all new. Why? Because it was planted within two days from Pesach and before Pesach and on. So all that wheat is going to be asur to eat. The oraita. The oraita, right? If I know that this wheat right now was planted from two days before Pesach and on, and now I have a piece of bread in front of me and I verified that this is 100% chadash, eating this, is, eating that piece of bread, is not any different than eating something not kosher. In Israel, eating that piece of bread is not any different than eating a non-kosher piece of food. Rav Yaakov yourself went so far as to say that there's no difference between chazir and a piece of bread that's from Kemah chadash. There's no difference. Now, there's a discussion whether or not this law applies in America or anywhere outside of Israel or it applies to a, to a field that belongs to a Goy also. That, does this prohibition only belong, apply to a Jewish field? Does this prohibition only apply in Eretz Yisrael? Does it apply even outside of Eretz Yisrael and even to Goyim? So the details we got, 
anything that was planted from within two days of Pesach and on, before Pesach and on, it's considered new produce, it's considered Chadash. That produce is Asur to eat. Anything that's planted from before that time, since it already ingrooted, created its roots in the ground from before Pesach, so on Pesach they bring a Korban Omer. We don't have that Korban today. But since that's the day that the Korban Omer was brought, that Korban Omer allows all the produce of the previous year. So anything that was already enrooted in the ground from before Pesach, from, was planted in the ground three weeks before Pesach, two weeks before Pesach, three days before Pesach, or two, two weeks before Pesach, that's already a machlokin. Right, let's just use three days. So anything that was planted from before Pesach, three days, already created its roots in the ground. Right, once it already created roots in the ground, the, the day of Pesach, the, when the Korban Omer was brought, already gives you a permission to eat all the produce that's going to grow from that planting that you made. But if anything was planted from within two days before Pesach and on, that means that after Pesach, if wheat was planted and it grew by October, November, that flour would be asur, would be prohibited to eat. That's considered kemah chadash. And that is asur doraita. The Shulchan Aruch says that this prohibition applies even in chutzla aretz and even by produce that belongs to a goy. And about 90% of the poskim hold like this. And we hold like that, la halacha. That something that's chadash, even if it's chutz la'aretz, even if it doesn't make a difference. The rift, the, 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 the rosh, and the shukhan, the rambam, they all hold the nisad right? right? The shukhan orach, the gra, the shach, they all, all the poskim mainly hold the nisad right? If you know that it's chadash, it's an nisad right? Now, how do you know? Say I have something in front of me, one time, say, my wife bought some oats. I don't know if it's a or not. So what do you do? I make a phone call to the OU. I ask them, is this Chadash or Yeshan? A lot of times they know. Sometimes they say, I don't know. You have to call the company and you have, you have to ask them based on the expiration date. Say you see the expiration date is in 18 months from now, right? You have to know from the expiration date and back when did they plant it and when did they harvest it. They have rules. They have rules, the one you know when the planting and the harvesting was. So I called them up and they gave me the details. I don't remember, this was a while ago. They gave me the details of what it was. And it was Mamash Chadash. It was planted after Pesach. It was harvested after Pesach. It was Mamash Chadash. 100% Chadash. I called and I found out. Now, this right now is 100% Chadash. 100% for, for the, according to the Shulchan Aruch, 100% Isir de Oraita. Eating these oats. It's like eating pig, put it, this, put it that way, right? It's an isodoraita. If you would cook in a pot with these oats, that pot, you would need to kasher it like you cook something treif inside. Now, that's if I know that this is chadash. That's if I know that this is chadash. Now, if I don't know it's chadash, I don't know it's chadash. The question comes along, and do I have to find out whether it's chadash? Or can I rely on the fact that maybe it's chadash? So there are many rules over here. I'm just going to simplify. When you have, Rav Yaakov yourself held that it's a safek, any item that you have, granola bars, beer, whatever item you have, you have safek, chadash, no chadash. If you have a safek, whether something is asur or mutar, it's a safek doraita, right? Especially when you can verify. So you can verify whether it's chadash or not. So Rav Yaakov, Yosef held, you're not allowed to eat it. Why? Because it's all one phone call away. You can verify is chadash or not chadash. And they can tell you. But the question is, that's when you have one suffix. Is it chadash or is it not chadash? But when you have two suffix, when you have two suffix, two doubts on something, right? So even though that's something that we have two doubts about, is an isidore or item, when you have two valid doubts, halakhically, that fall under um, the halacha of sveik sveika. Of course, the sveik sveika has to be accepted in halacha. Not every sveik sveika is accepted in halacha. So the Rama says, if you have something in front of you and you don't know it's chadash, you don't know. You have a sveik sveika. What's a sveik sveika? One, it could be that it was previous year produce, and the korban omer on Pesach time came along and it made it mutar. Two, maybe it was not the previous years. But it could be that when it was first initially planted, it was never, it, when it first initially planted, it was never asa to begin with. It was always mutar. Right? So it's a question of, 
Shveik Shveik Hashem Echaronat. Meaning to say, if I have, the Rama says, it could be that it was from last year's produce, right? So, Bechlal, it was already Mutar, right? The second suffix is, maybe it was planted from before Pesach, and the actual Korban Omer came and made it Mutar, right? So, he says that either or, it's Mutar, right? Either or, you have a Shveik Shveik over here, it could be Mutar. So he says that since you have these two sveikot, that it could be that it was from last year, it could be that it was from right before Pesach and the Korban Omer matted it. So since you have two sveikot, the Ramah says you could be made by two sveikot. You know, it's okay, it's mutar by two sveikot. So in the Ashkenazi countries, they didn't have an option of finding thing, these things out. They didn't have all the accessibility that we have today, Yashin and so on and so forth. So they didn't have a choice. They needed to eat. They needed to survive. They needed to drink. They couldn't have any very way of verifying it. So in Ashkenazi countries, a lot of times they relied on the Sveik Sveika. And they even went as to so far that even if it was not a Sveik Sveika and they knew it was Khadash, a lot of times in Ashkenazi countries, because they had no choice, they relied on the Bach. The Bach held that it doesn't apply by, by a Goy's produce. It doesn't apply by a Goy's produce here, and therefore the Bach said that it was Mutar. However, majority, 95% of the poskim all disagree with the Bach. The Bach is a very hard head to, to rely on in, in of itself. The Ramah Sveik Sveikam is more acceptable, we could say, more acceptable. We need to say the Bach would say, even if I know it's Chadash, it would be Mutar to eat. There, if I know it's Chadash, 100% we don't allow to eat. Mamash asu to eat. That you cannot allow. That you could throw out, right? But if I'm not sure if something is chadash or not, the question is, am I obligated to call and say, is this chadash? Can you, can, do, am I obligated to find out? Or I can say, no, I don't need to find out. Sveik Sveika. Right? I can rely on the two doubts that there are in halakha, and I can rely on the fact that maybe it's permissible and I can eat it all together. So, Rabbi Tzion Abashul says, you cannot rely on the Sveik Sveika during the week. Why? Everything is verifiable. Find out. You have so much other stuff that you could eat. Why do you need to eat this? Right? And it's also a little bit of a weak sveik sveika because simply the shukhnor chasur it. Right? And therefore, it's also verifiable. Maybe you have an obligation to verify. So Rabbi Tzion Abashul didn't like it during the week. But he said on Shabbat, if you don't have a choice and you don't know whether it's Yashan or not and you don't have a way of verifying, then you Shabbat, you can rely on the sveik sveika. Rav Yitzchak Yosef says, even during the week you can rely on the Sveik Sveika when necessary. Right? If a person has something in front of him, he doesn't know whether it's Yashan or not. You have a Sveik Sveika. Ah, but I can verify. He says that his father Paskins like the Rajba. The Rajba says that anytime you have a Sveik Sveika, even if I could verify, you don't have to verify. Right? You don't have an obligation to start verifying whether this is Yashan if you have a Sveik Sveika. Therefore, Rav Avadi held like the Rajba. You don't have to verify. He also held like the Rashba that you don't have to verify by a wedding. If a person goes to a good hall with a good hechshir, a good reliable hechshir, good mashgiach, good owner, the hall is a good hall. I have nothing to be concerned about. But I don't know whether or not the meat is by yourself. I don't know. It could be it is, it could be it's not. And even if it's not, it could be the halakha is like the poskim that say that it's mutar. And therefore, Rav Avadiyah says, if you go to a wedding and it's a reliable Ashgacham, you don't have to ask if it's Bet Yosef or not. You can align Sveik Sveika and you don't have to verify when it's a Tzorch Mitzvah and it's a necessity. Right? When it's a necessity. But he didn't allow just freely to go ahead and to eat like that Sveik Sveika and to allow Lechat Chila. He brings a story, Rav Yitzchak Yosef brings a story, that they went to Los Angeles and they brought in front of them a whole bunch of baked goods. And they asked, is it Yashan? They say, no, over here, reliance, fix, fake out, we don't verify. They didn't eat anything. Rav Ravadi said, they didn't eat anything. Rav Yitzchak said, they didn't allow, they didn't eat anything. Why? They said, ah, fix, fake out, you don't have to verify. We just said, Rav Ravadi held like that and it's safer. Only in the Torah, only when you have a need. What would be a need? Shabbat, if you don't know. Or if you go to your parents' house, or you go to your in-laws' house, and you don't know what it's Yashan or not. You don't feel comfortable asking. They're from the Torah, Shomer the Mitzvot. Everything in the house is glad kosher. You have nothing to be concerned about. I'm going to start asking him questions now. It's not a comfortable feeling. Or you go to your rabbi's house and he's Ashkenazi. And you're not going to start asking him, is this Yashan, is this Sadat? 
That's not respectful, right? So there, you, you can't ask. So if you can avoid it, avoid it. If you can't, then you can rely on this fake fake out. That's a tzorich. That would be a considered a mokum tzorich. Person wants to go to a, a brit milah. Person wants to go to a wedding. And he wants to become the midst of having a suudam. And it's a reliable place. He doesn't know if it's yashan or not. There he would say it's a tzorich. Maybe over there he would say it's a tzorich. But to freely go lechatchile and just to buy whatever it is in the market and not to verify anything, that would be very hard to allow. Therefore, lechatchile, everything a person should buy should have yashan stamp on it. Yashan, everything should say yashan, yashan, yashan. A lot of products then yashan. Now yashan season is kicking in already. Therefore, we already know Yashan season is kicking in. We stock up on cereal, we stock up on oatmeal, we stock up on breadcrumbs. We just put it somewhere where it'll be safe. Store it, just store it. And we know we have enough Yashan products throughout the winter time. We don't need to verify, we don't need Tzveikot. What do I need to rely on? Sveik Sveika, find out, put myself in the Machloka, the Oraita. Some people say you have to find out in the Sveik Sveika. Some posts can say you don't have to. What do I need all this Tzveikot? Why should I put my Neshama in a situation where I'm possibly contaminating it? I'll stock up on everything before and I'll leave it there. Baruch Hashem, today go to the store. The market is flooded with Kemach Yashan. Cookies, cereals, breads, flooded with Kemach Yashan. For the few things that you need to have because uh, you need to have it, you know, whatever it might be, a cereal that you like, stock up on it now. Take yourself out of the headache and L'Chadchila person should try, if he didn't, to try to put himself on these Yashan groups or to have like this Yashan thing. You can find out easily today if something is yashan or not. Be the evidence if a person is stuck in a situation where he can't find out, or it's Shabbat, or he's in somebody's house and he doesn't feel comfortable asking. Be the evidence you can rely on this fake fake not to be able to ask. You want to ask a question? Fake fake by a restaurant by someone's house. Shema, perhaps we just bait Yosef. Perhaps we don't pass on the bait Yosef. Why don't we have that by? Why don't we? Why don't we have that by? Uh, we do. First of all, you have a problem like that because when you have the two sveikot, the shulchan aruch paskin against the two sveikot, it becomes a little bit more complicated. But you're right. Rabbi Benzion has a different sveik sveik aruch. Rabbi Benzion said, right? Maybe, maybe. Right? Maybe it's Chadash, maybe it's not. Even if it's not, maybe it doesn't apply in Chutzarot. So that's Rabbi Sion Sveik Sveikah. He brings that also, that Sveik Sveikah. And there you have the Ramah Sveik Sveikah. Whatever, however you want to look at the Sveik Sveikah, you have some sort of a Sveik Sveikah. Right? But they're not strong Sveik Sveikot. Because the majority of all post can say that it's Aster. Right? Uh, it's, that's, a, that's a stronger Sveik. It's whether or not it applies in Chutzarot or not. It's not Yachol Yivayi. It's not able to no, but you have the Shulchan Aruch Paskin that it does. 95% of Paskin hold that it's in it to the rights, even Chutzaret. It's a very mute, it's a very weak Sveik Sveika. But I bet yourself it might be a little bit easier. You don't know whether it is, and even if it's not, you don't know the type of Sircha they found. Maybe the Sircha they found Bechla wouldn't be a problem according to the Bet Yosef anyways. By, by meat, it's a little bit easier. But at the end of the day, it's all Sveik Sveika. The question is, do I have to verify or not? The Chathili, you should verify. Right, if you could, but at the end of the day, if you can't, you can't. Because not everybody agrees you don't have to verify by Sveik Sveikah. So you want to rely on the fact that you don't have to become Tzorch, you're allowed to. You see that Ravavad himself, you only give the Heter of Sveik Sveikah, where you don't have to verify by a wedding or by places of need. He himself, when he was in Los Angeles, he didn't eat it. I have a Sveik Sveikah. He didn't see a need to rely on it. Right, the Chathila person should be Makbid. Because many Poskim hold you have in front of you right now, Safek Doraita. So fake the right there. Rav Yaakov Yisav held that if you, this is like eating treif, mamash, you cook stuff, you have to mach your dishes. It's, it's not so simple. And today there's an abundance of it. Why should you have to be reliant on to be mako? Just verify. The Hasidim, they purposely want Chadash. That's something else. There's the Baal Shem Tov with the dream of the Bach. And they say that Yashan has infestation, Chadash doesn't. And so, Hasidim have a whole different approach to this. They rely on the Bach. They rely Mamash on the Bach. I once had something that was Mamash Chadash, and I had a Hasidish rabbi. He told me, give it to me. I said, uh, I didn't give it to him, but whatever. Right? I don't want to take the responsibility. They rely on the Bach, but we, are ant- we don't rely on the Bach. 95% of Postcom don't rely on the Bach. We say the Bach is completely not reliable on Allah in of himself. To use it as a safek, we'll use it as a safek, but just to rely on the Bach, we don't rely on the Bach. The Hasidim, they do. Right? So therefore, it's not, uh, what they do is not, uh, the Hasidim daven mincha when it's set to kochavim for us also. Right? That's the way they know it, but we're not allowed to daven mincha at that time. What? Well, 
Yeah. Where? No. No, but a lot of stuff is yashan. A lot of stuff is yashan. If it says yashan on it, you can rely on it. You don't have to be concerned. Sometimes I tell you the truth, what I realized is the ashgacha, right? I saw, I went to a bakery, I said it said yashan, right? I called ashgacha, I said, do you take responsibility of the yashan or not? They're like, no, if it's not an our certificate that it's yashan, if the store just notes that it's yashan, then it's only their responsibility, you're taking their word for it. Not always when it says yashan, is the ashgacha taking responsibility for the yashan. It has to be on the actual to uda, that it's yashan. I called up a very big bakery one time in Borough Park, because I asked called their hashgacha, I found out also if they, the hashgacha is on top of the yashan, they said no. So I asked the lady that picked up, I said, you're yashan? She said, like, yeah. She's like, yeah, we do it on our own will. We just, we want it to be yashan. The hashgacha doesn't require it. So you're relying on them, but again, you have edachad neman b'yisurim. The shayla comes in, where the edachad neman is yisurim, whether you don't hold it in the isr, because that's a different shayla. They don't have any reason why, why would they want to dash, go back to dash? It's not more, yashan is not more expensive. It's not about buying it, it's about convenience. I don't have to stick to one, produ- one guy that's, I know for sure. What if I call him, I need 500 pounds of flour of Yashan. I don't want to have, I only have 100. I need to have a whole a bunch of stuff ready this week, right? I'm not going to start changing my printing labels and this and that. I'll just buy from a different place. So it becomes a responsibility. It's not everybody wants to do it. But the said that's the halakha, right? A khatkhila person should be aware of these things and take uh, precaution. But the if in a situation where you can't verify, Right, you could rely on the fake sake. That's not